Miami Vice, an American crime drama television series, was a groundbreaking series for its time. With its installment of undercover cops in Miami, a city known for high-level crime, the show was able to capture a lot of attention thanks to its unique and appealing visuals, graphics, music themes, and rich straighter-designed plots. The show's genre spanned action, crime drama, neo-noir, and mystery thriller. With five seasons and 114 episodes, this show was a huge hit in the 1980s. The show primarily focused on drug trafficking and prostitution, counterfeiting, arms smuggling, and other similar crimes, with the cops attempting to complete their prosecution case against the criminals and ending in a gun battle at the end of each episode. The direction, visuals, and appeal of the television series are highly regarded, as evidenced by the show's numerous accolades. Michael Mann, the show's executive producer, also created a film based on Miami Vice, which was released in 2006. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. The intriguing odyssey of crafting the legendary Miami Vice TV series. The Miami Vice television series premiered in 1984 on NBC. Michael Mann Productions and Universal Television contributed to the show's production. The show's major producers included Michael Mann, Anthony Yurkovic, George Dick Wolf, Robert Ward, and Richard Brahms. Michael Mann, one of the show's most prominent producers and directors, has been named the most influential neo-noir director due to his sensibility and sense of design. The idea of for it came from Brandon, who had just written MTV Cops on the legendary napkin. The napkin was handed over to prominent Hill Street blues writer Anthony Yurkovic. The main subjects of the program included drug trafficking and prostitution, weapon smuggling, and other related crimes. The episodes usually start with police pursuing the criminals and end with a gun-wielding, well-planned brawl between the two groups of people. Typically in the show, the prosecution's case would unravel midway through because the prisoner could escape or new criminals could could enter the scene, complicating matters even more. High-level prosecutors were present and represented at various levels of government agencies and other law enforcement departments, which further complicated the conviction process of our two valiant vice officers. Regardless of their rank or profession, the criminals would typically tip off anyone for their save and succeed in defending their criminal empire. While the show started off with appropriate police procedures and protocols, these were gradually toned down as the series progressed in order to maintain the fun element and allow the creators to express themselves freely. The plots of all the episodes were based mostly on real crimes that occurred in the city of Miami. It's interesting that Miami was the center of drug trafficking and that the show focused primarily on the same issue. The immigrants' active connection to Latin America for the purpose of dealing in firearms was prevalent in Miami during that period. As the show went on, it moved from a humorous theme to a serious detective battling dishonest officials. The program ended after a run of up to six years. Miami, in particular, is where the show first started in the United States. One contentious issue was the location of the show's filming. Even though Los Angeles was the first choice, the crew ultimately decided on Miami after filming for Miami Vice began. Miami wasn't exactly booming at the time. In fact, the areas were pretty dead, especially South Beach, which served as the main shooting location. Old people were hanging out on the beaches, which weren't exactly fun and lively either. As far as we can tell, the earthy tones chosen for this show were strongly rejected by executive producers. He placed a great deal of emphasis on the use of distinctive colors and imagery to draw viewers in and keep them watching the show longer. It was very exciting for the onlookers because the vehicles and attire of the police and criminals were tailored to the upper classes of society. To make the beach and the surrounding walls suitable for the show and ensure its success, the crew went to great lengths. With its elaborate cinematography, large budget, and emphasis on art and designs, the show was a huge success. An episode of Miami Vice cost roughly $1.3 million, which at the time was a lot of money, especially for a police drama. Speaking of budgets, the show's creators were unwilling to back down or make compromises in any area, and they were willing to pay thousands of dollars more to achieve the one perfect shot they had visualized. They even chose original recordings for music instead of music from television shows, which enticed labels and artists to appear in the show since it increased their numbers all at once. The show's title theme, which also peaked at number one in the 1985 Billboard charts, was made possible by Michael Mann, a man of taste, 
and his inventiveness enabled his teammates to express themselves freely. For this, Joan Hammer was immensely appreciative. Its stereophonic sound, which offered the audience a novel audio-visual experience in the 1980s, was one of its most notable features. When they prioritized the needs of the audience, the show directors and producers wisely placed their stakes in the show rather than blindly following the herd. Because the show was intended for an MTV audience, it placed a greater emphasis on images, music, and emotions than on the story, dialogue, or characters. In its debut, the show received multiple Emmy nominations. In terms of fashion, outlook, video games, and show plots, the program had a variety of effects on society and its citizens. Miami Vice had a big impact on the video game Grand Theft Auto, Vice City. Two undercover police officers are introduced. One is white and the other is black. The introduction of two undercover police officers, one of whom is white and the other black, follows the same pattern as Miami Vice. In terms of style, the 80s saw a major rise in the popularity of jackets, t-shirts worn with suits, the rule against wearing socks, and Ray-Bans. The show was able to increase Miami tourism, which Miami officials take very seriously. The primary cause of the show's decline was Michael Mann's departure from the leading role. The transfer of Dick Wolf wasn't all that successful because the show evolved from a light-hearted, humorous police drama to a serious struggle between good and evil in addition to several human tragedies. When compared to previous seasons, when the show was primarily about wealthy criminals and drug dealers. His emphasis on the crimes and their gory details revealed a decline in both viewership and ratings. Everything about the show, including the locations, music, and fashion scene changed. After the fourth season, the show's ratings began to decline. NBC decided to combat this by reducing the number of episodes for the fifth season, which was eventually extended to a full run. By this season, the majority of the writers had left, and things had gone crazy. In an interview, Dick Wolf stated that the program had reached its peak and couldn't be brought back. The Free Fall, a two-hour episode, marked the conclusion of the program. Exploring the Episodes of Miami Vice Miami Vice, a criminal drama based in Miami, Florida, starts off lightheartedly and humorously. The show features exquisite designs, hues, and expensive automobiles. It also features a good number of humorous moments, including those involving Elvis the Crocodile, Izzy, and Noogie. The show opens with Sonny Crockett going through a terrible loss after Eddie Rivera, his partner, was killed in a car bombing. The first airing lasted for two hours. They pursue a man to New York while conducting an investigation into a cocaine dealer. Their relationship is put to the test in the interim by a number of highs and lows involving crimes, occasionally threats against Crockett's life, which tragically result in the death of Lieutenant Rodriguez. In a banger episode wherein Crockett and Tubbs collaborate with the DEA to take down a vicious heroin ring in the center of Miami, they take on global crime. The suspense and action build as our boys confront threats they have never seen before, leading to a breathtaking conclusion. We witness the emergence of a romantic relationship between Calderon's daughter and Tubbs. Raphael's killers, the Calderon cartel, are vanquished by Crockett and Tubbs. After that, a drug empire headed by the Revilla in New York starts to emerge. Crockett's rooted animosity is sparked by a past flame when they come across a notorious arms dealer. As our heroes confront their most difficult case to date and face their personal demons, the conflict becomes dangerously personal. He is shooting DEA agents in Miami one by one, and Crockett and Tubbs can only handle so much before taking up the case because Gina is now in danger as well. Not too long after, Orlando and Angelina, the heads of the Cauldrones, make their triumphant return. In addition to developing feelings for Angelina, Tubbs ends up becoming a father to her child. However, what follows is extremely shocking. Orlando breaks Tubbs' world by using the mother-child duo as bait to ensure his escape. Unfortunately, luck is not on the two's side, and they both meet a terrible end in a car bomb explosion. In order for the two vice cops to finish their cases, they had to constantly battle a great deal of corruption within the department. Most of the time, the prisoners would either manage to escape or tip officials of all ranks, which made their work more difficult. Crockett and Tubbs form a band with an old friend, a Japanese Yakuza member played by the formidable Kerihiro Yuki Tagawa. We enjoyed this episode because it showcased the show's thrilling and audacious swordplay. Our heroes learn the true cost of loyalty and what it really takes for police 
police officers to uphold the law and administer punishment. One of the main episodes witnesses a suspenseful two-part story unfolding in New York City as Crockett and Tubbs pursue a vicious drug lord through uncharted territory. The ensemble of guest stars, which includes Pam Greer and Gene Simmons, intensifies the action and keeps you on the brink of your position, seeking more. In episode 19 of season 2, Crockett and Tubbs make a triumphant return. The dynamic pair finds themselves searching for the drug lord who detonated their main office. Their rage and desire for revenge skyrocket after such a severe defeat. The Vice Police team did everything they could to apprehend the criminals, including chasing after them and meticulously planning their strategy. The boys demonstrate once again why they're the greatest in town with plenty of cameos and heart-pounding action. In another episode, protecting a crucial witness in a highly sensitive drug case is a race against time for our crime-fighting team. The Miami Heat is turned up to 11, resulting in an exhilarating ride of action, suspense, and surprise plot twists. Phil Collins plays the eccentric drug dealer. Michael Mann left the show as it moved into later seasons, and Dick Wolf took over as the line producer. As a result, there were general changes made to the set's designs, photos, locations, costumes, and colors. Elvis and Noogie, the first amusing components, were gradually cut from the TV show. While they go undercover to fulfill their missions, Tubbs and Crockett are in constant danger of dying during the show. It is a very dramatic show when Tubbs goes undercover as a prisoner to expose a drug ring that is being run by dishonest correctional officers. However, when it comes to apprehending large drug dealers, and occasionally smaller ones as well, such as the high school football player who supplied heroin to a dealer, Crockett never fails. In fact, he is saved under the guise of his athletic career. This season, the show steers clear of its typical comedic moments and lighthearted drug dealing in favor of themes like human trafficking and illegal adoptions, and instead presents us with some very somber human tragedies. This season's episodes are giddy, violent, and dark for the most part. In order to uncover a criminal who is killing young girls on a regular basis, Crockett and Tubbs also go undercover. The criminal has an odd fondness for glass stalls, but some issues delay their revelation. They also look into a string of homicides by Miami docks involving strange police officers and drug dealers. In one of the episodes, when Crockett must choose between saving a death row inmate and possibly risking his own safety, his morality is put to the test. This episode's intense emotional turmoil and nuanced assessment takes viewers on a terrifying emotional journey as they examine the true nature of humanity. Additionally, Crockett ends up in a life-threatening situation when, acting in self-defense, he ends up getting shot and goes into a coma. This shocks the other members of the Vice Squad, who begin to reflect fondly on Crockett. By the end of the previous season, only a small number of the crew and writers were still there. The ratings for the show had declined as well. This season also tackled subjects like child molestation and homosexual relationships, which were somewhat taboo at the time. Valerie Gordon reappears and brings her story to a satisfying conclusion. Crockett's memories also start to fade a little, but Tubbs has already started organizing how he is going to carry out the orders he has been given to eliminate Crockett. Throughout the season, Crockett and Tubbs' partnership also dissolves a little, and on multiple occasions, Swiddick fills in for them. Crockett takes a vacation to unwind and recuperate since he needs it really badly. However, things go wrong when he is abducted by two murderous individuals who are so committed to their work that they would rather die than be apprehended. Billy is not happy with the way things are going right now, so Crockett's former wife, who had moved away to get married again, doesn't really end up in a great situation. Taking on his father's boots, Crockett approaches his son Billy, offering him support and companionship. In the two-hour series finale, Crockett and Tubbs set out to protect Jen. Crockett decides to sell everything and leave Miami behind, while White Tubbs chooses to return to New York. The main characters of this show, Sonny Crockett, Detective James. Don Johnson portrayed Detective James, also known as Sonny Crockett, who served as his alter ego and undercover agent to investigate the massive crimes and drug dealing occurring in Miami. He was a member of the Metro-Dade Police Force. To graduate, he attended the University of Florida. Despite his athletic ability and affiliation with the University of Florida Gators sports team, he was forced to retire from competitive sports due to a serious knee injury. He participated in the Southeast Asia Conference, also known as the Two Tours of Vietnam. Then he became a patrol officer with the Metro-Dade Police Department.
apartment, but he went undercover and assumed the identity of Sonny Burnett for a mission. He described himself as a middleman and a drug dealer. He initially toyed with a Ferrari Daytona Spider, a Scarab offshore powerboat, and a sailboat where he resided because it's a Michael Mann production. Elvis, his pet alligator, tolerated him well. In the show, Sheena Easton portrayed Caitlin Davies, a pop singer. Crockett, a police officer, ended up being her bodyguard. Her testimony was needed in a case involving racketeering. The plot thickened, though, when Sonny married Caitlin after falling in love with her. Their romance, however, was short-lived as one of Crockett's greatest enemies murdered his cherished wife. Later on, Sonny also found out that he and his wife were seven weeks pregnant, which caused him a great deal of anxiety, grief, and guilt. Before Caitlin Davies, Sonny Crockett had a wife named Carolyn Crockett who was portrayed by Belinda Montgomery. Nevertheless, she relocated to Ocala and remarried in order to raise her child, Bonnie, with her second husband. The name Sonny Crockett is shared by the characters in the television series Miami Vice and Hill Street Blues. Anthony Yerkovic, who wrote the script for Hill Street Blues, also created Miami Vice. Detective Ricardo, Rico Tubbs. Former New York Police Department, Detective Ricardo had taken the trip to Miami for a private reason. Rafael, his brother, was also a member of the police force and was brutally killed by Calderon. In order to exact revenge for his brother's passing, Ricardo moved to Miami while Rafael was there. On occasion, when they were on an undercover assignment, he would work with Detective James. However, in the pilot episode, after violating multiple implied codes of conduct from the NYPD, Ricardo grew afraid, followed his friend's advice, and was sent to Southern law enforcement. In New York, he was not willing to lose his job. Subsequently, he relocated to become a permanent partner in crime for Crockett when he joined the Miami department. They both went back to living undercover as high-ranking drug dealers and cartel members in order to expose crimes and win convictions. Typically, he would pretend to be Rico Cooper, an affluent buyer from out of town. Lieutenant Martin. Edward James almost played this character. Informally, he was also known as Marty Castillo, a lonely man who preferred to be by himself. In the 1970s, he also worked as a DEA agent in Southeast Asia's Golden Triangle. He was a man of conscience who also followed his morals to the letter. Whatever the circumstance, he liked to uphold them and didn't stray from them. He was very intelligent, brave, and bold. It was he who objected to the CIA's proposal to use heroin sales to pay for its operations operations abroad. He was a devoted government agent who didn't think one should profit at the expense of another's suffering. He also took Rodriguez's place as the OCB chief. Detective Regina Gina Navarro Calabrese. Sandra Santiago portrayed this character. In the show, she portrayed a female detective. She possessed courage, strength, and a strong will. Following Crockett's first wife's divorce, she ignited a brief romantic plot with Detective James, who happened to be Crockett. They remained close friends even though their relationship didn't really lead to anything worthwhile in the long run. Detective Trudy Joplin. Olivia Brown played this character. She accompanied Gina on patrol. Her primary nature sometimes clashed with her professional demands, leaving her in a state of confusion. Even after all that time, killing a man was not something she did naturally, and she was frequently seen finding it difficult to deal with the fallout. Although she exuded a tough exterior, her inner strength was lacking. She also had a significant part to play in the alien accident in which she encountered a UFO with James Brown portraying the alien. Detective Stanley Stans Michael Talbot portrayed this character. In the show, he played a police detective and was best friends with Larry Zito. He had good taste and enjoyed music. He enjoyed listening to music and was a huge fan of Elvis Presley. At first, he was portrayed as a good police officer with strong morals and principles, but these later became shaky when he developed a gambling addiction. Detective Lawrence Larry Zito. Larry was Swiddick's best friend. He was portrayed by John Deal, who was only in the program until 1987. He used to work as Stan's partner on surveillance rounds and was an excellent detective. During a mission, he met an unfortunate and premature end when the drug dealer gave him a false overdose. Lieutenant Luis Lou Rodriguez. Rodriguez was portrayed in the program by Gregory Sierra. He was the vice unit commander and a lieutenant in the police force. In the very first season, he was killed off. Unfortunately, the assassin who was brought to kill Crockett was the one who killed Lou. 
Why it's a must-watch show till now. The first show of its kind was Miami Vice. It was the first time that a cop and criminal were shown pursuing each other in such a marvelous way. It's not often that we see police officers driving off in a Ferrari while wearing elegant pastel-colored suits in a police drama. However, Michael Mann's portrayal of the neo-noir genre was concise. The two officers were undercover to handle drug dealers, human traffickers, and armed smugglers were continuously enhanced by the actors, costumes, designs, signs, and of course the settings. For the audience, it's an absolute hit because of the background music that never stops. This show portrayed the rise of female law enforcement officers and their battles to stay on the front lines with a great deal of realism and nuance. Gina found that the event in which she and the other detective went undercover as a prostitute to catch a pimp named Lupe Ramirez was extremely traumatic. She was raped as a result of her decision to have sex with him. Even though she killed the man in the last scene of the show, her experiences as a female male police officer remained. Another fantastic idea was the portrayal of homophobes and the conversations about homosexuality among the police force in the show. It's pretty amazing considering how common AIDS was in the United States at the time. The show's large budget, intricate design, and music budget all demonstrate the commitment and drive to make it a big hit on television. As we see in the show, the two vice cops' brotherhood and camaraderie are truly admirable. The horrific crimes the two police officers routinely investigate also have a constant impact on their personal lives. Although the loss of their wives in one or more incidents is undoubtedly shocking, the police are portrayed as being very brash and returning to their work after a while. The show realistically captures the reality of police officers who are enmeshed in the drama of constantly searching for and apprehending criminals and drug lords, as well as the ongoing suffering and headaches they endure. Yurkovich's creation was undoubtedly a fantastic creative endeavor. It established a high bar for the future standards of the police drama. It's possible that more people are aware of Michael Mann's film, but Miami Vice and its adaptions and influence still have a lasting impact. Whether it's the games that have been developed in response to the show's creative influence, the newest police drama, or the consistently popular fashion trends in society, Miami Vice did leave a lasting impression. Marvelous Verdict The show appears to be very entertaining. The high-quality production and visuals make for an enjoyable viewing experience. There are no strict procedures or protocols, and the light-hearted moments add to the overall enjoyment of the performance. Crockett feels like an overall package with his good looks, dialogue delivery, and the essence of former manhood when needed. He balances all of his sides in a very well-meshed manner. He is cool, friendly, and extremely charismatic. In contrast to his partner Tubbs, who is more of a stable guy whose sincerity is reflected in his looks and who shows a bit of depth and darkness at times, he feels spontaneous and on the fly. One of the reasons for this could be his strong desire to avenge his brother, or it could be something else. However, their bond is strong because they all balance each other and provide stability. Elvis the Croc was also a good addition, adding to the television series' fun banter. The show is great to watch, and if you want to binge, roll in. Take a note from these classic moves from the Miami Vice Cop Boys if you want to cop around with your best friend at some point. After all, you are what you do. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one, and be safe. Thanks, everyone!